As promised, some bonus material for you. I want to tell you a little bit about a trip I took to Ghana and West Africa in 2008. A little quick background on this. Um, and around 2006, I believe it was, I had, maybe 2005, I got a phone call from a former student of mine, an ASL student, who called me and left a, a voicemail for me on my office phone. She was very excited and said, I need to talk to you. I just got back from Ghana and West Africa and I visited the deaf schools there and I had the most incredible experience and I learned things that you just won't even believe. So I called her back and she started telling me about this and it really was incredible. And I said, why don't you come visit my class? I'm teaching a, a class right now in deaf culture and I think it'd be really cool if you could come and share with them sort of what you found. And so she did. And she presented at this class and during that process, she met up with another one of my students who was in that class at the time and the two of them got together and formed a nonprofit organization, an NGO, non-governmental organization, aimed at helping the deaf education system in Ghana, in West Africa, specifically in helping the kids by sending volunteers from the United States over there to work as teaching assistants in the classes. This is important because in Ghana, the teachers in the deaf schools are not trained in sign language of any sort. In fact, they go through their training program, teacher training program, most of them maybe never even met a deaf person, had never considered that they might be teaching deaf people, and upon graduation, they're assigned by their teacher, or by their, by the, you know, not actually by the university, by the government, assigns them to work in a school. So these teachers get sent there. My student got to the schools, long story how she ended up going there, but she ended up in Ghana. Um, she's a school teacher, she had summers off, she'd been traveling around places on vacation, decided she wanted to go somewhere that maybe was not a resort place, but maybe see how sort of people in developing countries live. Um, and she ended up in the school and then she came into the classroom, the first classroom she went to visit, she came in and there was a classroom full of these deaf Ghanaian kids. And she sat there and waited and there was no teacher present. And eventually she sort of said, and, and by the way, in Ghana they use a, f a form of, their Ghanaian sign language is closely related to American sign language because back in the 50s or 60s, a man by the name of Andrew Foster, a deaf man, deaf black man from Mississippi who graduated from Gallaudet University, went to Africa and established a, an amazing number of schools all over throughout, primarily West Africa, but in other places as well and he used American Sign Language, which was his language, as the base language for instruction, and that's persisted since then. So even though it's very different uh, from what you've learned here, it's a dialect. Even though they will call it their Ghanaian Sign Language, from a linguistic perspective, it's a dialect. It's not very difficult to communicate. There are some differences, to be sure, some pretty significant ones, but you still can communicate across, across these two different language forms. So anyway, my student says to the, to the students, where's your teacher? And they said, traveling. And she said, what do you mean traveling? She says, well, just traveling. She says, to where? She said, well, we don't know. And the students are all gathered around and they're working on this, they're working together and they've got like two books and they're working and they said, well, what are you doing? And they said, well, the lesson's on the board there. The teacher writes it on the board and then leaves. And we said, well, when's the teacher gonna be back? A mm, couple of days, a couple of weeks, we don't know. So these teachers, because they're not very happy to be where they are, they go in, they write their lesson on the board, and then they leave, and the students have very limited resources. In many cases, they have only one or two textbooks for an entire classroom. And she was fascinated to see how these kids got together and taught each other, because in their school system, you have to advance from grade to grade by passing exams at the end of the year. And she was stunned by how motivated these children were to pass those exams. And gone to their nine deaf primary schools, and there's one secondary school and the primary schools all have about 300 students and the deaf high school has two to three hundred students so you can see going from nine to one their chances of getting into that are not very good and the students work really hard to get in there so she took over and said well what are you learning and she said oh well i know this would you guys mind if i taught you and they said sure and so she started teaching this that's basically what this organization does. It's called Signs of Hope. I'm going to put a link up. You can look. They've got a, a very interesting video kind of promoting what they do. 
and I'd encourage you to take a look at it. I think it's interesting. If we had more time, we might even discuss some of the techniques that are used in the video and sort of do a little linguistic analysis on that as well, because I think there are some kind of things that are kind of interesting there. Now, having said all that, these two students started this organization. They're operating for a couple of years, and it turns out that they'd made the arrangements through the primary school and the secondary school are both in the same town in Mampong. Uh, which is up in the mountains in Ghana. And they had made the arrangements to take these volunteers over there through the headmasters of these schools. Well, the headmasters apparently hadn't notified the National Department of Special Education, who's responsible for the deaf schools, that this was happening. And when the national, organ, a national governing body discovered that this was happening, they called a meeting of the headmasters from all of the schools um, various administrators, a couple of scholars in the area who were involved in education, in deaf education, special education, and all of the NGOs, so the United Way, the Peace Corps, anybody who sent anybody over there um, was called to this meeting. So my former students came to me and they said, would you come to this meeting with us? We might be in trouble. And I said, what do you want me to do? And they said, we need someone with some credentials such as yours to come over and to help us kind of sort through this. So they appealed to the university, the university agreed and sent me over in 2008 for this meeting. So I went to Ghana for a three hour meeting. And there's a, a picture here I'm gonna put up for you that shows this, uh, this meeting that we had with all of these people. Uh, it turned out that th these people were not in trouble at all. In fact, the people who were in trouble were the headmasters for not notifying the, the Department of Special Education what it was that was going on so that they could then share it with the other schools. They also then told all the other NGOs that they needed to align what they were doing with Signs of Hope because they thought so much of this program. So that turned out really well. But while I was there, um, I met a lot of people. I visited different classrooms and spent a lot of time just playing with the children and talking with them and just having a great time taking their pictures. Um, they would pose next to buckets and rocks and anything. They just loved when you bring out a camera. They wanted to see themselves in pictures. And we just had a blast. And they, of course, thought I was quite the novelty because I'm white and they don't see a lot of white people there. So the kids would follow me around and they would be going like this on my skin to see the color change on my skin. And they would play with the hair on my arms or on my legs as wearing shorts and they'd follow me around and play with that. And even though I don't have a lot of hair on my head, I'd be wearing a hat and they'd come up and they wanted to touch the soft blonde hair that I had. Um, it was really a lot of fun to be there and to see the kids. And so I visited different classrooms. Um, this fellow in the middle here has become a close friend of mine. His name's Marco uh, Stanley, which is his sort of Americanized name that he's adopted. And he is now a teacher at the school at the time he was teaching some classes there while he was working to get his teacher's credentials and it was interesting I asked him I said so what do you teach right now and he says well I teach an English class and I teach a leather class and I can't remember there was something else but I said leather class well, that's interesting I said I when I was in high school I took a leather class leather working class too just for fun to fill out a credit and you know I made a sling for my rifle and we made you know various different things he says so what do you what do you kit what do you make with the kids what do they make I said oh well we we don't actually make anything and I says well you don't make anything he says, well we don't have any leather and I said well Marco how are you teaching them leather without leather leather working he says well you know it's an important skill it's something they can do that maybe they could get a job with so I said so do you like get the tools and you hammer the designs into wood he says oh we don't have any tools I said, Marco, how are, you, how are you teaching a leather class without any leather and without any tools? And he says, well, I have a book. And that's kind of the way the school worked over there. They're very limited in resources. Okay, so we visited around. We did different things, talked to different people. And one of the days, um, Curry, who is the president of Signs of Hope, came to me and he said, hey, we sponsor kids, as you know, to come to the school it costs about $280 for a year of education, food, clothing, everything for a child at the deaf schools there and he said we have different people who pay to sponsor these kids and every the way the school system works there is they're in school for three months I believe and then they're off for one or is it two and one anyway they get a month off every so often and then when they come back to school it always happens that some of the kids don't show up 
And he said, some of the kids who didn't show up are the kids that we're sponsoring. So I'm going to go out today and try and track a couple of them down. He says, would you like to come with me? And I said, sure. So we get a driver, we get in this car, and we drive to a little village about 20 miles away. And we go there in search of Abigail. So this is Abigail. And we pull up to her place, and she lives in this little cement house. It actually wasn't terribly small, um, kind of open air structure. And in the backyard, um, there's just there's no grass or anything. There's dirt. They have these cute little goats running around, jumping on little logs and, and uh, stones. And Abigail is there in the backyard, scrubbing clothes in a bucket of filthy water. And he told me, Curry told me as we went there, I said, so what's her story? And he says, well, it's really an interesting story. He says, we're going to go talk to her mom. And he said, well, it's not really her mom, it's her grandma. And I said, not really her mom, but her grandma. Okay. And, I said, and then he said, well, it's not really her grandma, technically. And I said, what do you mean technically not her grandma? And he says, well, they're not really by blood related at all. And I said, okay, Curry, you got to explain this to me. It doesn't make any sense. And he said, well, when Abigail was, they guess, five or six, nobody really knows, the people in the village found her wandering around the village and she had apparently been driven to this little village dropped off and left there and so this woman took her in and has raised her as her own and so I said wow so it's not really they're not really related at all and he said no they're they're not and so this is Abigail's grandmother and her cousins which are um, the, the grandmother's real daughter's grandkids um, you'll notice the little boys wearing a little pink shirt and I think it's just, the shirt says love princess on it they get a lot of clothing from goodwill type of uh, efforts and so it, their fashion sense is definitely different from ours and the gender boundaries don't have the same sort of connotations that ours do in a lot of our American clothes so anyway we go to meet this woman and we're there with the driver and he speaks twee in English but he doesn't sign so Twi is the the language of the Asante people and she the, the grandmother here doesn't speak English she only speaks Twi. Abigail signs and doesn't speak either language and she communicates with the grandmother basically through gestures so we come around the corner and there's Abigail and she's washing clothes and she comes over and we talk to her and they introduce me and she hugs the workers that are there that she knows from the school and eventually we go over to talk to um, Abigail's grandmother with, through this interpreter and Curry explains to her he says you know school just started last week and Abigail didn't come back and we're worried about her we didn't know you know why she didn't come back and she says well we didn't have the money to pay for the taxi to send her there which would have cost about two dollars and seventy five cents something like that so we couldn't afford to send her back and he says, oh, yeah, that's too bad. That's okay. He says, well, we're here and we've got a car. Can we take her back to school with us? We can give her a ride. And the grandmother, this is where it got really interesting. The grandmother said, yes. And then she said, but she never does anything to help around here. She doesn't wash her clothes. She doesn't bathe herself. But bathe, bathe herself, she doesn't do anything to help here. And she starts shaking her head. And we kind of look at each other, and Curry said, so she doesn't do anything to help? Nope, she doesn't do anything to help. And he said, well, that's not good. She needs to help. He says, that's right. She needs to, she should help, but she doesn't help here. She's not doing any good. And at the same time, we're thinking, wait, she's over there washing clothes right now. So Curry says, oh, well, that's too bad. Um, yeah, well, can we... You know, we'd like to take her back to the school because they're getting started. We don't want her to fall behind. Would that be okay? And she says, yes. And she says, starts shaking her head and says, but she doesn't wash her clothes. She doesn't bathe herself. She doesn't provide any help here. And we kind of hit this impasse where she tells us, yes, it's okay to take her back. And then she says, well, except that she's not doing any of these things. So I sort of broke off after a few minutes and went over with one of the other um, volunteers who was there, and we went and talked to Abigail. We said, so Abigail, I see you're washing clothes. She says, yeah, that's my job. I wash the clothes every day. And we said, well, that your grandma says you don't wash clothes. She says, well, what do you mean? I'm, I wash them every day. Why would she say that? And she says, well, we said, well, what about bathing yourself? Do you bathe yourself? She says, yeah, I bathe every day. 
I said, well, if your grandma says you don't bathe yourself. And so she's not sure that she's going to let you go back to school because you're not doing that. And she looks perplexed and she says, I, I bathe every day and I wash the clothes every day and I do other things. She told us a couple of other things or chores that she does. And by this time, we were all really confused. So we go back over and we talk to the grandmother again. And the same conversation takes place. And at about this point, I think, wait a minute. There's something going on here more than what's being said. And I'm a linguistic anthropologist. I ought to be able to see through this or at least get some clue as to what's going on. And it kind of took that mental switch to think about it. He said, because obviously what's happening here is not what everybody thinks is happening. There's something else going on. And so we go through the whole process again. We ask her, can she go to school? And she goes, yeah, that would be okay. But she never cleans. She doesn't do this. She doesn't do this. And all of a sudden it hits me. And I said to her, I said, through the interpreter, I said, oh, so Abigail doesn't do laundry? She doesn't wash clothes? And she says, nope. And I said, and she doesn't bathe herself? Nope. And she doesn't help you with the cooking? She says, nope. And I said, so you won't miss her when she's at school at all, will you? And she said, nope. We won't miss her. She doesn't do any of this stuff, so you can take her. And it occurred to me that what she was saying was that it, she was making it all right that a member of this household, who's a contributing part of it, would be leaving to go off and get an education by saying she doesn't do any of these things. And we were interpreting as saying she wasn't going to be allowed to do these things because she wasn't contributing. So as soon as we got through that, we said, okay, then... I guess we'll have her go get her clothes and things. Um, what else will she need to get? And at that point, she gestured over to Abigail, had her come over, gestured to her, told her, go get your things. At which point, Abigail went and got this nice Nike backpack that you see with all of her personal belongings, which consisted of a beat-up metal bowl, one change of underwear, and one other school uniform, and a razor blade, a two-sided razor blade, which all of the kids there have, by the way, and they all carry around machetes. They, they actually mow the lawn with five- and six-year-old kids swinging great big machetes to cut the, the lawn at the school every Thursday. It's crazy. You would, around here, you know, we, we worry if a kid brings a one-inch knife to school. There, all of the little kids have double-edged razor blades. They use them to cut their hair, um, which they all have to keep trimmed so that they don't have lice outbreaks. And then they use these great big machetes all the time, just hacking and stuff constantly. Uh, it's pretty different from what we have. So anyway, we, we drove back to Mampong and took Abigail with us. And she was very shy, just adorable, very, very cute. And the whole way through, um, she and I played together. I made faces at her and she started laughing. And it was just a wonderful opportunity for me to sort of get to know her. We got back to the school. And there's one of the teachers at the school who, when he got assigned to the school, took a very different attitude than the rest. He took a leave and went back to college to take Ghanaian Sign Language classes and has come back and he just loves these kids and he is a really great influence for him. His name is Daniel. And when we got to the school, Daniel saw Abigail and he called to her, waved her over and he teased her and he played with her and he sort of roughed up her head and then he sat down in front of her on her eye level and said, Abigail, it's very important that you get a good education, so you've got to pay attention in school. You've got to work hard, you know. And, will you, and he committed her. He says, well, will you do that? Will you promise me you're going to do that? And she said yes, and then you know, we sent her off and we made arrangements to get her additional clothes because she had lost her other clothes and, and had sort of a happy ending. So I want to tell you a little bit about Sylvia. Sylvia is a girl who I met while I was there in Ghana and who had a real impact on me and I had heard a lot about her before I got there. She's actually featured in the video on Signs of Hope International.org um, and really was a, a kind of a, a neat experience for me. Sylvia is deaf and blind and she lives at the school and she is as motivated to get an education as anyone I've ever seen. And frankly, very often I get frustrated with students here at UVU who don't seem to understand the value of an education when I've seen someone like Sylvia working so hard to get her education. Um, we took Sylvia a number of books and magazines in Braille and at some point just before I went back to visit her, the school or the people at Signs of Hope had arranged to get her a typewriter that would type in Braille so that she could write 
and do her schoolwork in Braille. We went looking for Sylvia in the cafeteria at lunchtime and she wasn't there. And they told us that she was back in the classroom. And we went back to the classroom and we found her. And it turns out that she has not been eating lunch for quite some time and actually hasn't really gone to breakfast either because she feels like she can't sacrifice the time from her studies. So every day she skips breakfast, gets to school, and then gets by on snacks she can come up with or and, and just dinner. So we met Sylvia and she's a, she's a real sweetheart. She's funny, the, uh, the friend of mine, who former student who started the school said, now you're gonna meet her, she's gonna kinda fill you up. She wants to know who you are. So, you know, I have to tell all the women especially, she's gonna get kinda personal with you. But, so we did that, introduced us, we talked to each other for a little while, got to know each other. Um, and she's really amazing. She was one of two kids who was chosen, deafblind kids in Ghana, who went to an international conference in Uganda for deafblind children, and she got to fly on an airplane, and that was the very first time she felt carpeting was on the airplane. And she told me about that. She told me, she thought it was really funny. She said, why are the, on the airplane they had salt and pepper? And they were in little paper packets. Why are they so small? Um, really cute. So the last day that I was there, after eight days there, we were kind of at the school saying our goodbyes to everyone and the kids were playing around and a kid came up to me and says, hey, Sylvia wants to talk to you before you leave. So I went and I found her and we talked and she said, you know, I'm really glad to meet you and this and that. And I talked to her and I said, you know, Sylvia, she's really had an amazing life story. And I said, you know, your life story is just inspiring to me. I said, you should write a book about your life. When you get out of school, you should write a book. And I said, would you, would, I would love to read it. Would you write a book about your life? And she cocked her head, kind of as though she were looking away, although she can't see. And she said, no, no, I'm not gonna write a book about my life. And I said, well, why not? And a big grin came over her face and she said, because I'm gonna type it. So I'm still waiting for Sylvia's book and I hope that I'll get a chance to read it. But it really taught me sort of how she was able to get through the language barrier you see in the video, how she uses tactile language to communicate. She puts her hands on my hands when I was signing. And even though this language is created for vision, it works because it exists in the three-dimensional space for people who can't see, yet who can feel. My final story for you about my trip to Africa was one that taught me some really important lessons. Um, my mom has forever collected canes walking canes and she travels extensively she's traveled all over the world um, and she has everywhere she goes she finds a cane that has some sort of unique characteristic to the place she's been and so since that time other people have started to give her canes so when my siblings and I travel somewhere we tend to get her a cane and we bring it back and she adds it to her collection which is pretty extensive at this point so while I'm in Ghana, uh, from, not very far from Mampong is a little village where everyone in the village carves. They car make these wood carvings which they then sell to tourists, they sell them for decoration in other places, whatever. And in this little town, if you go through the, the main little highway, it goes through town there and they have these little shacks lined up all up and down the street. And you can go in them and they have hundreds, hundreds of carvings of different things from Mancala games to uh, little native African per people um, to uh, one of them had a life-size carving of Allen Iverson complete with a Philadelphia 76ers jersey. I mean just everything you can imagine and it was really a neat opportunity for me to go there and it was a good learning experience for me too because they have little price tags on everything. The currency in Ghana is called the CD which at the time I was there was almost exactly equivalent to one CD equal one dollar and they had these figurines carved and I had, a, I had several specific that I was looking for. I wanted a drum, I wanted, you know, uh, they, they make this interlocking group of people out of a single log um, that expands and closes and it represents the family and kind of this united thing that you come from one piece. And I wanted one of those and then of course I was looking for this cane. And then we go into the first shops and I'm looking around and I find something that I'm like, this is exactly what I want. And so I tell the shop owner, okay, I want this. So I pull out my $15, it says 15 CD, and they say, no, 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 no. It says 15, you're supposed to say eight. And then I say 12, 
and then you say 10 and then we say okay 11 and I, but I'm willing to pay and says no that's not the way it works you have to do it and so I felt really bad because I was like at home this thing would cost 75 bucks easily but you have to kind of do it the way that that they do so anyway I looked around and I finally found a cane that I really liked and the, there's a picture of it here with the guy who carved it for me and he showed me where he carves it and all the wood chips he's got a little box that he sits on and the wood chips around the floor and he's got uh, as a number of these people do their missing fingers and toes and got scars all over their hands um, and they color these by the way with shoe polish so if you want it buffed up really high they just buff it more if you want a dull matte finish they just put it on don't buff it up very much but he showed me this cane and he said see it's got the light and the dark intertwined and represents unity so it could be you and your spouse it could be you and your friend it could be you know whatever you feel like but it represents unity and I thought hey this is perfect it'd be my mom and I you know this representation of my mom and I and so I bought this cane and we headed home the next day and of course it won't fit in my luggage so I've got to carry it in my carry-on or, or it, just carry it with me and I put it in the overhead bin on the flight and we get to JFK International in New York and the international section of JFK is dominated by black employees so we've just come from Ghana where we're very few white people around at all um, and we come into JFK and, and there are a lot of Ghanaians a lot of other Africans in the area right there we're waiting for our next connecting flight and so it doesn't really feel all that different to us and we're hungry so we go over to a little cafeteria there and I get this tray but I've got to lug this cane around with me and everywhere I go so I get the tray and I ask for some food and they're putting the food on there and the guy in behind me in line says hey is that wood or is that metal or, or plastic what's that made out of and I says oh it's made of wood and I'm kind of showing it to him and next to him is a this black woman dressed in a TSA uniform so she's obviously employed there and she looks at me and she says, what's that supposed to be, a slave or something? With this kind of accusing tone and, and manner. And it really took me back. Yeah, it really shocked me. And all of a sudden, I, and of course I, I said, no, no, it, it's just a traditional Ghanaian image. In fact, it looked kind of like the guy that made it. I bought it in Ghana yesterday from the guy who made it, and he's a black man. Um, you know kind of no no that's not what it means but and at first I thought gosh what was she you know that was kind of rude and then I, I, I got thinking about it and I thought you know here's a single object that has such different interpretations in different contexts even by people who we might categorize as being the same there's a black man here's a black woman we might categorize them and say oh these are black people they should see this the same but they saw it so very differently the artist saw this as an expression of his work with great pride that it was imbued with meaning that it had this unifying theme and he was so proud that, that I wanted to take his picture with it that he could be you know that I could remember him as the person who created this and then the same object less than 24 hours later is viewed as a symbol of slavery and of oppression and of power and domination and the suspicion is then cast upon me as someone who supports something of that horrific nature. And it's just, it occurs to me that that's the way language works too. That language is a symbol. That the words we use are symbols, but also the language form that we use is a symbol. The dialect, the language, the construction, all of the non-manual, the non-linguistic features that go along with our language and production are subject to interpretation and if we want to avoid miscommunication if we don't want to be accused of things that that aren't true and of being people who are not that we need to be very careful to understand the frameworks by which other people are interpreting our behaviors our language our mannerisms and if we can do that and at least if we can avoid them if we can then have the tools to recognize when it happens, when that misinterpretation happens, and can then clarify that, we can maybe make the world a little bit of a better place. And I hope that you'll be able to take the skills that you've learned through this course and apply those in your own life and maybe make your life a little easier, make people around you's lives a little easier, that you can communicate more effectively, resolve differences more rapidly and in a way that will 
re reduce the amount of cynicism that remains in our world today and it'll be just a little bit better place. I'm getting old but I'm just idealistic enough to believe that maybe the things that we do can make a difference and I hope that you'll take that as part of your education in addition to preparing you for whatever career you want to have but that your education will mean to you something about making the world a better place, making you a better person and a better citizen of the world and understanding others in ways that we're not prone to do because ethnocentrism is a universal characteristic.